You guys ever just miss being a kid? It was an innocent time spent running through sprinklers and learning new things. And I mean, who could forget that childhood classic? Staying up until 2 a.m. on a weeknight to clean animal guts out of a saw in a meatpacking plant. Yep, yep, you heard me right. If the Iowa legislature gets its way, it will be legal for 14 year olds to do the infamously dangerous work of meatpacking. Because nothing says land of the free, home of the brave, like kids not old enough for algebra packaging cow parts. There's been a recent surge in state initiatives to relax laws restricting child labor, with 10 states introducing, considering, or passing such legislation over the past two years. Provisions range from lowering minimum ages, extending work hours, lifting restrictions on hazardous work, and eliminating age verification or parent and guardian permission requirements. Those horrifying black and white photos of early 20th century children covered in soot doing hard labor used to just feel like this screwed up remnant of a long forgotten past. The sort of thing that would leave us thinking, how did those psychos ever think this was okay? But much like Taylor Swift's compelling live shows, child labor is back. And ironically, I think it might be the case that some of some of Taylor's earliest tours and musical output were an instance of child labor. Now, according to the Economic Policy Institute, in the last year, there was a 37% rise in the number of minors employed in violation of labor laws, marking a 283% increase since 2015, while the number of minors illegally employed in hazardous occupations is up 94% since 2015. And of course, this is all going down at a time when so much political discourse, especially on the right, is about protecting the children with panic about dangerous books, drag shows, or even just conversations about sex and gender. Surely lawmakers would consider physical labor at least as dangerous as a book about gay penguins, which is a real thing that people freaked out about. A book about penguins that were gay, that loved each other. And we made a recent video that kind of dove into the politicization of children, so you can check that out if you want. So what does it say about our society when we have children spending their precious youth working the night shift at a factory. Is this just the real life version of the saddest Bruce Springsteen song ever? Let's find out in this Wisecrack edition, Child Labor. It's back and it's f***ed. And guys, before we get into it, just a quick heads up. This is a pretty heavy topic. It's pretty upsetting to talk about and think about. I'll try to make the journey as, you know, non-depressing as possible, but stick with it. It's an important topic and we gotta think about it. So thanks in advance for going on this journey with me. Now, the idea that childhood is something to be protected is a fairly recent concept. <laughs> Child labor practices in America peaked during the Industrial Revolution from 1820 to 1870, and meaningful change didn't come until the 1930s. That's a whole hundred years after Britain made child labor more or less illegal. And then before you Brits get all snobby, remember that you, you literally just crowned a new king and he wears a silly hat and he holds his magical scepters and, and he has a bunch of jewels that were definitely not fairly purchased at the jewel store. American kids worked in textiles, mining, agriculture, canneries, and all kinds of factories, along with holding less dangerous but still all-consuming jobs as boot blacks and newsies. Take it, friends. Arm yourselves with knowledge. Now this meant kids, and particularly poor kids and the children of immigrants, weren't going to school, which severely hurt their chances at upward mobility. Luckily, by the late 1800s, labor groups had popped up to protest these practices and sought legislation to get kids off the factory floors. These efforts culminated with the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, which is, to this day, the primary federal law that regulates child labor in America. I don't know about you, but it just seems like that's the sort of thing that should be updated between now and, and 1938. Like, like at some point between where we're at now, 2023, and 1938, we could have just given that one a look. It's worth noting that when reformers started advocating for child labor regulations, they mostly did so at the state level. However, they soon realized that federal legislation was necessary to make meaningful change. Because if an industry got regulated out of one state, companies would simply just move to another one with weaker laws. Now, federal laws generally prohibit employing minors under 14, restrict the hours and kinds of work allowed for those under 16, and prohibit anyone under 18 from performing hazardous occupations. These rules are looser for agricultural work, where children as young as 12 can log unlimited hours in many agricultural jobs as long as they have parental consent and school's not in session. Un 12, 12 year olds, have, they, they work on limited hours. 
just unlimited hours. Reed Mackey of the Child Labor Coalition argues that this two-tier system is harmful, telling The Guardian, in my office, we can't bring in a 12-year-old to make copies. 12 is too young, but we will take that same 12 year old and put them in a field. There is basically no protection. Now, the question of why children need to work all summer raises a whole other host of questions about the general economic and social state in America. But if we did that, then this video would be an hour long, maybe more, and, and also I'd have a nervous breakdown. Now, for their part, the EPI recommends policy changes, including raising the minimum wage and eliminating sub-minimum wages for youth, ending the two-tiered system of standards for agricultural and non-agricultural work, enforcing wage and hour laws, passing key immigration reforms, and supporting workers' right to organize and form unions. But as we mentioned, besides having weak laws in the first place, there's been a huge surge in minors being employed in complete violation of those laws. This past February, the Department of Labor found that Packer Sanitation Services, Inc., PSSI, had over 100 kids between the ages of 13 and 17 illegally working for them in hazardous jobs at 13 different meatpacking facilities. These kids were doing work overnight, cleaning razor sharp saws and operating dangerous equipment on the kill floors of slaughterhouses. The kids were working on the kill floors of slaughterhouses. At least three kids sustained injuries, including burns from caustic cleaning chemicals. The Department of Homeland Security is running a parallel investigation because many of these kids appear to be unaccompanied migrant children who have been trafficked. PSSI, owned by the world's largest private equity firm, the Blackstone Group, was found to have engaged in systemic use of child labor across eight states. Also, for a fun time, just Google like the Blackstone Group and see the fun things that they've been up to over the years. The U.S. Department of Labor quotes wage and hour regional administrator Michael Lazary. The adults who had recruited, hired, and supervised these children tried to derail our efforts to investigate their employment practices. In other words, this wasn't just a case of some 15-year-old trickster growing a mustache so he could work on the kill floor at the slaughterhouse. You hear that, Bojack? Vincent is an adult, and I'll bet he knows how to treat a lady. He very clearly isn't and doesn't. This was an institutional problem. Those doing it knew it was illegal, and then they attempted to cover it up. You can't make a tomlet without breaking some Greggs. Meanwhile, several Hyundai Kia factories in Alabama are under investigation for employing Guatemalan migrant children as young as 14 as low-wage assembly line workers. As of this February, the DOL was investigating over 600 child labor cases, including ones involving McDonald's, Dunkin' Donuts, and Chipotle. They note that this is likely a small fraction of the actual cases out there, as so many go unreported. So are the kids just yearning for the mines? No, not so much. Over the past 20 years, there's been a decline in youth labor force participation, suggesting that young people are choosing to delay going to work in favor of finishing high school. Now, the EPI calls this a positive trend for both individuals and the economy, not one that should be slowed or reversed. Of course, when we talk about child labor, we're not talking about kids with the privilege to make the choice to put off entering the workforce. More bluntly, child labor is very much a class issue, and the kids that lawmakers are fighting to send to work, especially especially in the most dangerous fields, are overwhelmingly migrant children. Now, some 130,000 unaccompanied migrant children came across the U.S. border in 2022. Many are eligible for asylum, but the epic backlog of asylum claims leaves a lot of them in limbo for years. As their claims process, they're ineligible for work permits or any of the already limited social programs for Americans living in poverty. The Biden administration has compounded the problem by pushing to get children out of shelters and released to sponsors who have not been properly vetted and will sometimes traffic the children into work. Again, that's, you know, because the, the kids, they come and they seek asylum and then, oh, we'll, we'll give them to these people to take care of them. And then those people traffic them into work. Guys, do you ever just think that some people are just like really bad? Like, I always want to believe that everyone you know, is potentially good, that we're all trying our best. But then there's adults out there who look at a migrant child and think to themselves, I could trick the government into giving me care for that child so I could traffic them into work and probably get money from it. There's just human beings that think that. Though the Department of Health and Human Services calls minors monthly after they're released to sponsors, the Times learned that the agency loses contact immediately with a third of those children. 
According to the Times, in Los Angeles, children stitch Made in America tags into J. Crew shirts. They bake dinner rolls sold at Walmart and Target, process milk used in Ben and Jerry's ice cream, and help debone chicken sold at Whole Foods. As recently as the fall, middle schoolers made Fruit of the Loom socks in Alabama. In Michigan, children make auto parts used by Ford and General Motors. And, and guys, we live in a world where people are like, oh, protect childhood, but oh, they can't, they can't see a, a drag queen, they can't see that, but they can debone chickens and It's like, what the f 15 year old Carolina, who works in a Cheerios factory, told the Times, sometimes I get tired and feel sick, but I'm getting used to it. She's, she's getting used to it. Because that's, that's something a 15 year old should do. She told them that her stomach often hurt and she was unsure if that was because of the lack of sleep, the stress from the incessant roar of the machines, or the worry she had for herself and her family in Guatemala. <sighs> At this point, it's really hard to not just take a step back and take a deep breath and truly ask God himself how the f this is all happening. Well, the convoluted nature of modern supply chains makes it pretty easy to explain. Professional staffing agencies act as an intermediary, supplying migrant children to employers who feign ignorance, saying that they didn't ask for age verification because they assumed these agencies had done their due diligence. Companies doing this include General Mills, which after the Times exposed its use of child labor, said that it recognized the seriousness of the situation and would review the findings. It all feels very... I'm shocked, shocked to find that gambling is going on in here. You're winning, sir. Oh, thank you very much. But let's go back to the recent push to loosen child labor laws, which would make some of this legal. How do lawmakers and advocates justify these laws? Well, there's a range of arguments. The Koch brothers-backed Foundation for Economic Education published Let the Kids Work, which argued that having a job builds character. It's okay, it's a job. Yeah. Shooting bolts into cows' heads is a job, but I, I, it's not how I want to spend my Thanksgiving. Other conservative think tanks argue that these regulations are simply government overreach. But because you're not idiots, let's just f***ing say it. It's all about profits. There's a reason industry lobbyists are pushing to convince state governments to weaken their laws. The kinds of jobs that children can do have historically been undervalued. Like how fast food workers aren't supposed to make a living wage because, you know, if they get too comfortable, they might not try to hustle their way up the ladder. Today, we're in a competitive labor market, which is driving wages up. As the EPI argues, employers seem uncomfortable with the reality that they must pay higher wages to attract workers in a tight labor labor market. Yet this is exactly the way markets are supposed to work. You guys ever notice that the people who are most obsessed with the free market are, don't like it as soon as it doesn't work for their precise ends? It's like, oh, the, the invisible hand, let the market do its thing, except, no, the market can do its thing, except for when it says we gotta pay workers more, then no, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta intervene. And one quick fix is to hire children and pay them less. As Marcy Goldstein-Gelb, co-executive director of the National Council for Occupational Safety and Health put it, I think there is this myth that you need to put young people in any possible job because there are openings. I think we are moving into a new age where we need to recognize that workers of all ages are seeking to earn a sustainable living and not put themselves in harm's way. On a federal level, the US is trying to crack down on child labor, with the Biden administration proposing a Child Labor Exploitation Task Force, a new enforcement initiative, and an appeal to Congress to increase penalties on those who violate child labor laws. But that isn't stopping the fight for loosening child labor laws at the state level. Guys, this isn't in the script, but you know who recently did this was uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. And when she signed the bill, she surrounded herself with kids. Iowa's proposed bill would let kids as young as 14 work in industrial laundries. Kids 15 and up work assembly lines and kids 16 and up serve alcohol. It also creates a special driving permit for kids as young as 14 and a half to drive up to 50 miles to work. Of course, the legal driving age there is 16. They're doing this because they would rather do that then pay people more money to work these jobs. This is just the real thing that's happening, guys. If there's something else happening, explain it to me in the comments, but it seems like this is just what's happening. This law also eliminates the authority of the labor commissioner to require work permits for minors in certain occupations and gets rid of rules that forbid parents from making false statements in order to get their kid employed. Okay, guys, get ready for this one. Um, It also removes liability for the injury, illness, or death of a child laboring in a work-based learning program. So, so what this is saying is that if a kid, 14 and a half or so, driving themselves to work is in a work-based learning program and, and they get injured 
or they get sick or they die, there's no liability for that corporation. And that's that's in a bill in America in 2023. But this isn't just happening with industrial labor because the hottest new trend in child labor is of course, the work of being a child influencer. Now the TikTok addicts out there might not want to think about it, but being an influencer is work. As Madison Edwards of the Texas Tech University School of Law wrote, child influencers earn millions each year with the most successful of them earning upwards of 29 million. They make their money from sponsored content and monetizing their social media platforms. Currently, child influencers have no legal rights through traditional child labor laws, such as the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 or state-based child actor laws. As a result, the risk of financial, physical, and psychological exploitation of child influencers is immediate. Now, while they're not at risk of losing life and limb, unless they're taking a selfie on a mountain, being an influencer can commodify and suck much of the fun and innocence out of childhood. Before Tessa Latifi writes for Teen Vogue about Claire, a teenager using a pseudonym who's been making videos with her family since she was a toddler, writing that Claire says both her parents left their jobs because the revenue from the YouTube channel is enough to support the family and to land them a nicer house and new car. Claire said, that's not fair that I have to support everyone. I try not to be resentful, but I kind of am. Once she told her dad she didn't want to do YouTube videos anymore, and he told her they would have to move out of their house, leaving no money for nice things. Claire, if you're watching, I'm so sorry, and you have every right to be resentful, and I know it sucks to acknowledge this, but your dad is a, is a piece of shit, so I don't know. It's just like Claire's dad. But whether you're in a factory or making content, child labor, is just plain bad for kids. A 2001 study found that working too many hours hurts teens' health and development. Another study in 2022 showed that minors are both developmentally and biologically more vulnerable to workplace injuries, while a 2019 study demonstrated that they are also more vulnerable to long-term harm from workplace hazards like chemical exposures. And a 2022 study further showed that out of all workers, those with the lowest earnings and highest unemployment rates are people who dropped out of school, an obvious effect of loosening labor laws. And while there's always hope that the recent rise of organized labor could shut this all down like it did 100 years ago, as long as governors, state legislatures, and well-funded lobbyists are dedicated to getting America's children back to the factory, it's going to be hard to stop. Given the very real harms associated with child labor, it's baffling that so many lawmakers are going on the record for kids to be doing more and truly dangerous work. As we mentioned, we're living in the midst of a moral panic about protecting the children. But it seems that though there's plenty of political will to protect children from say, being read a book by a drag queen, that will disappears when it comes to protecting them from dangerous working conditions. It's almost as if when protecting the children is incompatible with improving the bottom line, lawmakers are perfectly willing to choose money over children's health, lives, and safety. This suggests that the rhetoric surrounding keeping kids safe is really just that, rhetoric. But what do you guys think? What does the return of child labor say about our country and our priorities? Is it just one more manifestation of corporate greed or is something deeper going on? Or is the value of children learning hard work as American as for-profit colleges? Let us know in the comments. Um, thank you so much to all of you who made it through this whole video. It was intense for me. I imagine it was intense for you to think about all this, but we appreciate that by supporting this channel, you are all giving us the space to dig into stuff like this um, and to take on heavier topics because we do think it's important. So thank you so much. Um, all of our patrons, you know that I love you very much. Uh, I don't feel like doing a whole pitch for that right now, but there's a link in the description if you guys want to check that out. Um, but as always, thank you so much. I promise the next one won't be as gnarly as this, and I'll see you later.